Tonight we're discussing the security situation in Libya following an attack at the French embassy in the capital. The first attack uh, on a diplomatic compound in the capital since the fall of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. A reminder of who we have uh, in the studio tonight. Uh, Francis Perrin is the editorial manager of Arab Oil and Gas. There he is on the left. Uh, also with us, Arnaud Castagnier, an analyst at Milestone Group. I've got Stephen Ikovic here in the studio with me as well. He's from the American University of Paris. He's a professor there. And in Beirut tonight, Anas El Gamati is uh, from the Carnegie Endowments Middle East Centre. Thank you once again uh, to you all for being with us. Uh, and, and Stephen Ikovic, we were just talking in the break there, weren't we, about how this attack is, is, is worrying not only for the French and their security interests, but it's very damaging for Libya in the long term as well. Well, when, when we have an incident like this, there are a lot of unknowns and uncertainties that surround it. So what can we say for sure? We can say that this does create, at least temporarily, uh, an environment of insecurity. Uh, that's not good for business. It's not good for foreign aid. It's not good for cultural and social relations. Uh, uh, so that's clearly negative. On, on the other hand, uh, we, as we understand, the, this does not mobilize public sentiment against France uh, or against the United States. In fact, it backfires on those who perpetrate the, this kind of terrorist act. Uh, when, you, when, when you mobilize the population, they've mobilized the population of terrorists, but against themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like you know, attacking Sufi mausoleums in, in the same way. It just goes against the local culture. Uh, so in that sense, it has a positive uh, outcome because it, it reinforces a certain sentiment of, of distaste and disapproval of those terrorists who represent. That's something that's really foreign to the Libyan culture or the Tunisian culture or other cultures for that matter. And I said, Gamasi, do you go along with that? By all means, I think that, you know, jihadism by its very, by its very nature is um, it's like a, it's like a fish that only swims in certain waters. It needs you know a certain kind of condition for that water for it in order to swim. And those conditions are simple, you know, political marginalization, um, you know, infringements upon freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. And those very things are being celebrated by the overwhelming majority of the Libyan populace and all those other countries that are coming into the Arab Spring. So I think AQIM is actually undergoing its most you know pertinent existential threat ever. And by that nature, I mean if you know if if things continue and that we have you know, stable moves forward in the political process, you know, in the democratic process, then effectively it will die out. I mean, that's that's really what I believe. And I think, as, as was already said, it's really not going to, you know, it's really not going to mobilise, you know, popular dissent or anger against, uh, against the French. That's by no means, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen. I think the Libyans themselves came out of this revolution thinking we're now part of a global conversation. You know, we all found our voice and we can all come, uh, you know, come forward and, and be able to come a little bit closer to Europe, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, really, that's a great sentiment. I think if we, uh, at this stage, if we don't capitalise on that, then we lose, you know, it's a, it's, we lose it. It's, a, it's an incredible opportunity. But why then, if there is such a desire in Libya to, to move away uh, from, from this kind of extremism and, and this kind of... Uh, uh, atmosphere. Why then is it becoming so difficult to create those institutions? The army uh, is very weak, for example. The courts, the, the judiciary, uh, the police. I mean, why is there why is there not more trust in the public institutions? Well, I think there are, there are, there are two main issues. I think you know the state, by its very nature, needs to have a monopoly on these institutions. They can't be looked at as favoritism. Uh, and unfortunately, so far, the, the the cosmetic kind of landscape and the composition and the composition rather of the uh, of the state and its institutions are made up by various militias from various regions around around the country that have just had favoritism through the GNC or through the NTC uh, and have found loyalty through that. And that's the kind of the, one of the biggest challenges. The other real kind of existential challenge is that you know if you look down on the on, on the landscape of Libya, you find that you know um, police bases, intelligence offices, and army barracks are literally overrun by militias, um, and that it's been a real challenge to try and get them out. I mean, if you can't actually you know if 60% of your budget this year of 60 billion is being spent on salaries on our subsidies and it tells you that in fact you're not rebuilding these very institutions you're not building trust in these institutions and in fact there's also the other point which is that the the militias rather sorry the army and the police force were you know distrusted during the uh, the last 40 years and so there is you know people that literally again went home you know there are 20 20 to 40 percent of ab absenteeism in the police forces in, in, in libya there is no consensus amongst the new establishment and the former regime. And unless you have a new narrative which can build around that, which can make them move forward, then I think you're going to struggle. And that's really where the trust kind of lies, in being able to have some kind of inclusive dialogue which can bring people forward onto a national project which will build these institutions up and allow you know, security and stability to prevail. I, and one of the, we should add, 
one of the biggest challenges today for Libya is to build a state. Uh, unlike Tunisia, which has a history of a state and the presence of a state, uh, Libya doesn't have that, particularly after the fall of Gaddafi. Uh, so we can say that the Libyans are almost starting from zero, and that's another challenge uh, that uh, makes makes uh, makes th their their uh, movement toward the uh, oh, well, practically starting from scratch. Uh, so that, that's 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 a challenge. It maybe it could be an advantage in, in some in some ways. Uh, uh, but the, the Libyans almost have to start from zero, and that's not going to be easy. And that, that leaves a kind of vacuum, uh, which can be more easily exploited in, in Libya than in other places. So. Um, Arnold Castaneda, it seems this, this could go uh, one of two ways. I and mean, when you've got these kind of attacks, it'll either galvanize uh, the Libyan people to really stand up to jihadism and, and root them out of communities, as we saw in the wake of the Benghazi attack, or on the other hand, it could deter uh, investment, it could deter foreign business, and, and that could uh, could leave Libya in, in a very different place. Yeah, um, security issues are, are preventing Libya um, from being on the path of rec recovery, even if, despite the, those issues, um, our production, for instance, is... Uh, is very similar to the uh, the pre -war, to the pre war um, um, fi figures. So um, I, I, I think what is pretty important is also that we um, there's a big gap of perception of uh, the authority of the state between Tripoli and the rest of the country. Uh, the government has the authority on uh, on, on Tripoli, but not on uh, most of the uh, of, of of the other um, cities and states. In Benghazi, yeah, for in, example, in, in where. Ben yeah, foreign exactly. diplomats have decided to leave leave the city well alone, haven't they? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But but um, even even Muammar Gaddafi built some of his uh, authority on uh, on tribalism and on consensus mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, partnerships with um, with with other tribes. So there's no uh, there's no tradition tradition of uh, of important institutions, and it's uh, it's a, a national. Uh, uh, national spirit and uh, that we need to that the um, the Libyan government needs to to build and it's extremely uh, complicated of course for such a country and that's a big obstacle for, for Libya and it's a big obstacle for foreign investment getting is in isn't it this lack of a, of a centralized state clearly of course the fact that many people in Libya do not trust the, the, the state institutions after 42 years of Gaddafi regime is not surprising but uh, it's a key issue, as uh, was said uh, here, in social, political, economic and energy terms and in foreign investment. Um, as far as the oil and gas sector is concerned, which is, of course, a key sector in Libya economy, the, the government uh, set up um, uh, uh, petroleum facilities guard in order to, um, uh, to protect oil facilities. So it uh, numbers about 15,000 people coming from different rebel groups. And the problem is that there is much infighting between these groups. And so this force, which was set up in order to solve security issues, is sometimes creating security issues. So even in this key sector, uh, it's very difficult for the state to um, affirm or reaffirm its authority. And the fact that it is able to, to set up institutions including an, an army and uh, a police, which is a national army and national police and not an addition of different groups with different agendas, uh, including in this key sector. So uh, when you are a foreign investor, um, you will certainly think twice before investing in Libya, even if the oil and gas potential of Libya is very important and many uh, major oil companies did return to Libya. And we learned uh, two days ago that Total is increasing its exploration investment in Libya. But in this case, it's offshore. So of course, in terms of security, it's very different from a project which would be based onshore. Um, Anas, in Beirut, um, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if Libya could actually use this uh, tribal culture to its advantage. I mean, when we look at the other Arab Spring countries, as they're told, such as uh, Egypt and Tunisia, they have got more of a job in, in, in some ways in that they have to root out uh, those uh, individuals who are still uh, related to the old regime. They've got a lot more work to do. Perhaps uh, starting from scratch could work in, in Libya's favour going forward. I think it could. I think it's um, it's an incredible opportunity. I, I would say that, you know, for nuance here, that two-thirds of the population live between Tripoli, Baghazi and Misrata, um, and those two-thirds are under the ages of 35 um, well, two thirds of that population is under the age of 35. And so I think, you know, they're massively urbanized populations. They're, they're very well aware of what's happening around them. You know, um, you know, mobile phone penetration is up 70 percent. 
uh, internet again, you know, internet penetration is probably north of 40 percent. So those people are, are there willing to talk as well, you know, and learn mm -hmm. about what's happening in the rest of the country and across the border as well and across the shore. So I think starting from scratch with an incredible kind of, you know, canvas to paint on is a really, really great opportunity. But I think, again, you know, we mustn't forget that Libya is part of a, a global conversation. You know, the, the, the war on I wouldn't want to use the word or the term rather the war on terror that has some negative connotations towards it. But rather the, uh, the you know, the, the kind of moves towards asking extremism is, again, a global conversation. And we, it was also a conversation that we had in Europe 70 years ago with, um, you know, with anarchists who were also blowing up cafes, who also had long beards, who also, you know, had this kind of ideological motive to herald the new world through, through supreme acts of violence. These are all things that we've all already gone through. They may be just a hangover in Libya. But I think there's an incredible opportunity. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's one that we all have to kind of grasp onto. And I think going forward, if, uh, do you you know, think, if international sorry, relations do you th or anything to... Do you think that... Please. Sorry, do you think Europe is overblowing the, the threat from al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, in, in that, in, from what you're saying? It sounds like you think that al-Qaeda in the Maghreb yeah. is not as big a threat as, as people are making out? Well, I think it sounds more like a brand, uh, you know, a corporate brand at that as well. So I think perhaps there are... Well, they have their have own Twitter page with. now. <laughs> They may, they may do. I mean, this is a, a very interesting thing, like McDonald's, you know. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting way of trying to, you know, market themselves. And I think in that respect, they're an unequivocally modern kind of entity as well. And I think trying to brand it as such, I think there are, there are definite sympathies across the world, across the North, uh, you know, North African Peninsula. But even if you go towards, uh, you know, uh, the Middle East and the Levant, there are equally groups here in Beirut and in, in Syria as well that have sympathies when it looks at, um, you know, the geopolitical kind of struggles that they're facing. One mustn't forget that, there is a longer history of France and uh, and Britain and America of having you know kind of very very different approaches to the Middle East and I think now committing yourself to a higher cause to a, to a different way of diplomacy is probably the way forward. I wouldn't say it's overblowing it, but I would say it's looking at it in a sober a more sober light and looking at the ways in which international relations can be predicated on more equitable grounds. You know, working alongside governments, not doing kind of a you know shrewd cancerisms. Uh, sort of counter terrorism operations, which actually, you know, marginalised the populace at large and, and, and in fact created most of these issues. So I think you've got to kind of try and commit yourself to a higher moral uh, diplomatic uh, engagement. What do you make of that, Stephen? Uh, honestly, one of the goals of uh, a terrorist act like this is to provoke precisely the kind of discussion we're having here today on the air. Mm. Uh, so in that sense, it's a success also uh, because we're talking a lot about it. Uh, and that's part of the discussion. Uh, part of the international discussion because Franz Van Kett goes all over the world. Uh, and only not only Franz Van Kett is talking about this today, but everybody else. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, once again, we should probably remind, all our, remind ourselves, remind everybody that one of the goals of, of a terrorist act like this is exactly to provoke the kind of discussion we're having on the air right now. Uh, but we are, uh, we are it, it appears, coming to a kind of consensus that, that good things can, can come out of this, that mm. Libya is at least on the Indeed. right path. Indeed. Uh, and, and I think that uh, there, there is a sense, I, I, I don't know Libya, I go to Tunisia a lot, and then the, the, from the point of view of the, those I know in Tunisia, there is a certain sense that Libya can make it, uh, that there's certain optimism. Uh, uh, of course, Libya does not have the same long history of a strong and, and vibrant civil society that Tunisia has, uh, but the Libyans uh, evidently have started to build that civil society, and we, we wish them the, the, best of, uh, the best of luck in doing that. Uh, uh, Libya has a lot of oil as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Which uh, which can't hurt going forward. I mean, there was a time during the uh, the Arabs the Arab uprisings, people were saying that Libya could be the Dubai of North Africa. Could it... be a curse too, all of that. Yeah, <laughs> it could be a curse. Could be a blessing. What do you think? We say in French that comparison is no reason, but uh, <laughs> perhaps not Dubai would not be the the best um, uh, example for for Libya. Of course, it's very different. Dubai was forced to diversify its economy because its oil reserves were. Uh, becoming to disappear. Uh, Libya has, of course, a great future for many years and decades, in fact, in oil and gas. But as always in such countries, on, on, in economic and energy terms, the, the challenge is about the, uh, the good governments in order to uh, manage the oil and gas rent, the distribution of the oil and gas rent in order to build uh, uh, social uh, peace uh, within the country and uh, to use also the proceeds, parts of the proceeds of this rent to, to build um, a strong economy. And a strong economy is a diversified economy. So in this case, uh, Dubai is an interesting case in, in point, 
But it's clearly governance and security are key issues. But Libya has stronger sets, and I, I would um, remain rather optimistic in the medium to long term, uh, in the medium to long term perspective. But we know very well that um, uh, for Libya and for other Arab countries, after or during the Arab Spring or Springs, the, the transition is the most difficult path, of course. We know mm -hmm. um, we come from a di very difficult situation with 42 years of Gaddafi regime. We know what Libya could be in um, some years, uh, several years, but the, the path between the two, the, the two is very difficult to, 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 uh, to progress. Just briefly, Arno. Yeah, um, I would be very, uh, very optimistic as well because because uh, Libya has a um, and very important pot pot economic potential, but uh, there's a real issue of security in the um, uh, in the borders between Libya and uh, and Tunisia, for for instance. Um, for instance, where, where, whereas there was the uh, the attack on in Amenas, we uh, we then knew that um, that the group of Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar could go through the um, through the libyan border and uh, we know that there are also uh, links between the uh, ansar sharia in libya and uh, other um, uh, salafist groups in, uh, in 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 tunisia so even if um, libya is is on the path to recovery to economic recovery uh, in parallel there's still this very important issue of terrorism in the region mm. and uh, and the fact that Neither Libya nor uh, nor Mali nor uh, nor even Algeria are able for the moment to uh, to really secure their own borders. There's some work to do on tightening up those borders that we're just looking at right there. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, Arnaud Castagnier, Francis Perra, Stephen Ikovic, Andy Beirut tonight, Anas Elgomati. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks to you for watching. That's it for tonight's debate. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. This is France Man Catherine.